I remember election night in 2008. I didn't vote for Barack Obama because I knew that in the face of the global financial crisis, his answer would be even more massive Keynesian stimulus than Bush had ever done. But when he won, I smiled. I was proud nonetheless. His election was an achievement for American culture. As a nation, we'd gone from Jim Crow laws to a black president with a name that rhymed with our two most recent enemies, Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein, in as little as 40 years. That is wild. This wasn't the first time I was proud to be an American, like Michelle, but it was an amazing moment. And then he squandered it. It's time to call the whole thing off, this charade. And Obama should have done it. Obama and Eric Holder should have begun a process of reversing this moral panic. Instead, they, they fostered it. But that's not what we came here to talk about. That, I'll, I'll let that be the end you of know, my Glenn, I, I agree with you on that now. You're right. Those two men should have spoken truth to us in clear language repeatedly. If Obama had been as clear spoken on the reality of race in America as he has been consistently about the importance of fatherhood, he could have made a real difference. Maybe he could have stopped the BLM fringe before it went so viral that it hollowed out the skulls of an entire generation. It's not too late for him to step up and be a voice for good instead of a profiteer of doom. All he needs to do is reject conspiracy theories and tell Americans the truth. And that truth is that America, though far from perfect, has come a long way on race. We are not living in the 1950s. We're living in a world where Barack Obama has already won two elections as president. The truth is that the scourge of slavery is indeed a scar on our history, but by no means a unique one for the globe. And that America's founding in 1776, yes, 1776, was a crucial moment of moral clarity that helped bring slavery to an end. Newly independent states in America quickly moved to abolish slavery and were the first governments of their size to do so. The truth is that it is a blessing, no matter your skin color, to be born in America, which is why we remain a giant magnet for immigrants. Maybe to right the ship, Obama's next movie can be inspired by one of the many thousands of Nigerian immigrants who come to this country and become more successful on average than native-born citizens. Here's a few fun facts about the Nigerian-American experience that should give pause to any critical conspiracy cultist. They have higher median incomes than native-born Americans, over 68,000 per year versus just under 62,000 as of 2018. They are more likely to be in professional or managerial occupations than native-born Americans, 46% versus 31%. And the red state of Texas is home to the largest population of Nigerian immigrants in America. Try squaring these facts with the vision of America and conservative Southern America in particular as a hopelessly racist hellhole. If you want a personal window into why the culture of Nigerian American immigrants is so effective, I encourage you to watch my interview with Akbar Baja Biamila. His story of success is a testament to the American dream and we'll drop a link to it in the comments below so you don't have to search for it. Nigerians aren't alone, of course. The top of the income and success stats in the United States are not occupied by people of European descent on average, but by Asian Americans. Consider the leadership of the companies with values over $1 trillion. Apple, Tim Cook, an openly gay man. Microsoft's Satya Nadella, an Indian American. Alphabet's Sundar Pichai, an Indian American. NVIDIA's Jensen Huang, Taiwanese American. Only Amazon CEO Andy Jassy is a straight white male. Not that there's anything wrong with that. You have to be a conspiratorial kook to look at modern America and see a hotbed of white supremacy. But that's not all. There is plenty of progress for native born black Americans that we should be celebrating instead of trying to ignore. As Coleman Hughes noted in his article, The Case for Black Optimism, since 1999, the number of black students who earn a bachelor's degree has increased by 82%. As of 2017, 60% of black people at every education level said that they were doing better than their parents. Life expectancies are up. Teen pregnancies are down by over 63%. 
Thomas Sowell, one of our greatest living scholars and public intellectuals, offers a bewildering barrage of optimistic mythbusters in his most recent book, Social Justice Fallacies. But I'll pull one out just as an example. The 2020 census shows that more than 9 million black Americans have higher incomes than the median income of white Americans. More broadly, black household median incomes have been rising steadily over the past 30 years, from less than $37,000 to nearly $54,000 in 2022, adjusted for inflation. I could go on and on and on and on here. One last point, though. Let's talk about the police, because so much of the critical conspiracy theory's potency is driven by incidents of law enforcement using deadly force against black Americans. The history of police violence here is real and painful. It sets the stage for our biases. Martin Luther King said, quote, we can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. But just consider this. A brilliant, award-winning Harvard economist named Roland Fryer, who just happens to be a black man from a broken home, was one of the leading scholars to actually look at the data. Here's how he summarizes his conclusions in the abstract of his blockbuster paper, An Empirical Analysis of Racial Differences in Police Use of Force. This paper explores racial differences in police use of force. On non-lethal uses of force, blacks and Hispanics are more than 50% more likely to experience some form of force in interactions with police. Adding controls that account for important context and civilian behaviors reduces but cannot fully explain these disparities. On the most extreme use of force, officer-involved shootings, we find no racial differences in either the raw data or when contextual factors are taken into account. We argue that the patterns in the data are consistent with a model in which police officers are utility maximizers, a fraction of which have a preference for discrimination who incur relatively high expected costs of officer-involved shootings. That's econ speak for you. Now, that's not a picture of a perfect world, but it is a refutation of the critical conspiracy theory's core narrative. And for his sin of contradicting the conspiracy theory, plagiarist Harvard president Claudine Gay destroyed Roland's research center and tried to run him out of the school. So those are a ton of facts to consider. But look, I'm not an expert. I'm just a dad who's sick and damn tired of watching millions of young Americans be fed a disempowering conspiratorial lie, a lie that they can't make it in America, that the system, whatever the hell that's supposed to mean, is rigged against them. I'm also a guy who's finally done with this twisted, barbaric idea that the only people with a right to speak on issues related to identity are those of that identity. This bizarre, censorious ethic is one of the tools used by the conspiracy theorists to silence anyone who questions its validity. I can hear it now. Shut up, John. You're not black. Sit down. This posture is a complete rejection of one of our most unique and powerful capabilities as human beings, our ability to empathize, to understand things deeply by learning from the experience of other people. Yes, we can walk a mile in another man's shoes if we take the time to try. So if you're one of those conspiracy cultists who refuse to accept any other truth except so-called lived experiences and postmodern personal truths that used to be called opinions. Well, too bad. The only way to test if your opinion is actually rooted in truth is by having it challenged. Limiting who can challenge your opinions will only keep you in the conspiratorial dark. I'm not gonna let the fact that my grandparents came from Italy in the 1900s prevent me from advocating for the universal dignity and unlimited potential of every American regardless of their race. And you shouldn't want me or anyone else to do so. Let's all pursue truth with a capital T together. The lesson here for every American, but especially for our kids whose lives are just getting started, is simple and clear. We remain a land of opportunity, period, full stop. 
No race or class of people can be oppressors because oppression isn't an identity. It's a behavior performed by individual people. So take each person as they come and judge them for their actions, not what you think you know about them from across a room. And beware of cowards, criminals, and conspiracy theory kooks on college campuses or corporate HR departments trying to feed you disempowering, fact-free nonsense. They are trying to control you for their agenda. Don't give them the satisfaction. No matter what you look like or who you love, you can make it in America. There are fewer barriers standing in your way than ever before. So go after your dreams. Follow your spark. Put your freedom to work for you and discover what you're capable of because no one else can tell you that. America isn't perfect and it doesn't guarantee your success. But for all its faults, it's never been a better place or a better time to pursue your happiness.